We have two portions of our program this e evening. The first is dealing with solar options for your building or complex. And the second is dealing with the importance of proper pet policies for your building or complex. Starting off the program this evening will be Doug Hurts. He will deal with the solar portion of tonight's event. Doug is responsible for technology, design, and finance for Sunrise Solar Solutions. He is certified by the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners, the highest certification in the solar industry. Doug provides educational presentation to groups ranging from building inspectors to the American Solar Energy Society. He serves in his hometown of Mount Kisco on both the planning board and the energy advisory panel. Sunrise Solar Solutions is an affiliate organization of Sunrise Building and Remodeling of Briarcliff Manor, a longtime member of the Builders Institute and the Building and Realty Institute. Please welcome once again back to our membership meeting, Doug Hurst. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, let's see if I can see this from here. So, some of you have heard a little bit of this before, um, but thank you for indulging me once again. I want to get, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, tonight, I'm going to give you a little primer on solar, how solar works, what it's generally about, and then I'm going to focus on the economics, specifically for condos and co-ops, which I think is what you want to hear. So a little bit about us first. Um, we're sister, as, as Jeff mentioned, we're a sister company of Sunrise Building and Remodeling. My partner, Eric Messer, is in the back. Some of you may know him. Um, so. we, we started the company in 2009. Um, Sunrise Building has been around decades longer than that. But we had the great advantage when we started the company um, of leveraging 20 plus years of really excellent um, building techniques and the, the deep construction knowledge that that brought. So we were able to start this company really um, at, at full speed, um, being able to, in the beginning, take some of the folks who were on the construction side, cross-training them in solar, um, and we were real immediately. So this, it was a really interesting thing. We've, and we've done quite a lot in the six years. So six years for a construction company, not very long. Six years for solar, you're an old man. It's like dog years. Um, so what have we done? We've done you, may know, you may recognize some of the things up here. Um, we've done hundreds of installations, primarily throughout Westchester, but also Long Island, uh, throughout New York State. Um, recently, we hit an interesting milestone. Our, our systems collectively have now produced over two billion Watt hours of clean energy, so it's it's a real milestone. It's something we feel very proud about. Um, some of the things, uh, some of the, the things we built that you may be familiar with: the apartment building up in Peekskill. Um, that's a new housing project uh, that went up in Montrose recently. Um, buildings in uh, manufacturing plant over in uh, over in New Rochelle. Sleepy Hollow Country at the bottom is uh, one of the ones we've completed recently. Fascinating project. They're the first building. Uh, the first country club in Westchester to go green, so uh, and they did it in a major way. It's the largest installation uh, in Briarcliff now. So just some fun facts. Enough sun falls on the earth in one day to power everything we use, every, every device, everything, um, for an entire year. So that large box that you see is the available solar energy that's, that's available. And our, that teeny little blue box down at the bottom represents the annual consumption <laughs> Worldwide consumption of energy, all energy, electric, gas, oil, everything. Um, so we have quite enough solar energy to do whatever we want, if we only want to tap it. And those, those boxes on the, on the left of the screen represent the remaining stores of the, of the non-renewable resources left in the world. So um, solar is quite a viable option if we use it correctly and if we can, if we can make it function. Um, Germany, up until recently, was the, the leader in terms of installed solar per capita. They had more solar. Um, than anyone else. They've actually started to export clean energy. And Germany is not one of the sunnier places. Germany, the amount of solar resource they have is about on par with Seattle, not one of the places you go in the U.S. to get a suntan. Um, so the tri-state area 
has about uh, 1.3 times more, about 30% more solar energy than Germany. And Germany is wildly successful. So it's a matter of incentives. It's not a matter of, is there enough sun? So how does it work? We put panels on the roof, I'm just using a home, but we put panels on the building, sunlight hits them, and they produce DC electricity, direct current, just like a battery. We put an inverter behind that panel. That panel will convert the DC from a, a the DC that the panel's creating into AC, alternating current, run it right into your building. We connect it right to the distribution panels of the building. When the sun's out and shining, that energy is being fed right into your building. It's being used to power the lights and the appliances that are on. When we're producing more energy than the building's consuming, that energy, that excess energy, flows out onto the grid. And this is all possible because of net metering. So New York State and almost every other state in the union have, has net metering law, meaning that the utility has to buy back the energy, excess of what you're using at your site, at the exact same rate that they're selling it to you at. So let's say in the, in the daytime, let's say you're at a building, nobody's around. You're producing tons, sun's out, you're producing tons of energy, the meter's spinning backwards. At night, sun goes in, everyone comes home, flips on the lights, uses the elevators, you're using up energy. So the meter goes forwards and backwards every day, all day, exactly, automatically, without anyone doing anything. No fuss, no muss. And they're required, the utilities are required to buy that energy back from at the same rate they're selling it to you. Um, we use a web-based monitoring system, so the systems that we install, everyone can see exactly what's happening, there's no longer any is it working? How much energy is being produced? We don't really know. I look at my bill going, I don't know, did I save money here? So we have systems now that are very intelligent. You can see exactly what's happening in your building. Know that you know it's a winter month, we're not producing as much. It's a summer month, we're producing tons. Um, and the monitoring system looks like that. It actually shows you every panel that's on the roof. And we, we use this. I mean, the customer uses that, the building owner uses that to know their system's functioning properly, you know, how much energy they can, you know, they're, they're generating. We use this as a diagnostic tool and a performance uh, metric tool. So we want to know exactly how, we can see every panel we've ever installed anywhere. Um, and we can, dial, we can dial into each panel and say, yeah, it's performing perfectly, we know what's going on, or if there is an issue, we can, we can understand what that issue might be. Um, we do this because we use a microinverter technology, which basically puts that inversion of AC to DC right at the panel level, so we do it per panel. The advantages really are that we produce more energy. Um, we no longer have these systems where we have a big inverter that's humming and buzzing somewhere, and we have a single point, of, we used to have a single point of failure. So the really nice thing is we now have systems where the major components have 25 year warranties, both the panels and the inverters, the things that, the two expensive items in a solar system are now warranted for 25 years. So that's really a major, a major change in how the industry is, is, has been working. So is the site right for solar? Flat roof buildings, we don't really talk about this very much because we're typically going to find, we're at worst, we're for, you know, if we're lining up to the edges of your building, we're not more than 45 degrees off of south, one direction or the other, we'll find south. Um, if your building does have pitched roofs, we're going to look at the tilt and the orientation of those roofs, and then what we're really looking at is shading. So larger commercial buildings don't typically have a lot of shading. Most apartment buildings don't have much in the way of shading. But if there are lower, if there are lower buildings, if there are trees there, or if you have shading objects, elevator towers, things like that, we're going to have to stay away from those. So we want to use areas of the roof that are unshaded or as unshaded as we can, uh, we can possibly get. So, solar is a very strange beast. Uh, and New York is one of the stranger places to do solar. We have this interesting concept called remote net metering. So we deal with lots of buildings that have multiple meters or sites that may have multiple buildings on them, each of which has one or more utility meters. New York State allows us to build a single solar system, attach it to a single meter, and where we're creating excess energy, we can flow that energy virtually to another meter owned by that property. So if the, if the building, if you have three buildings in a complex, one has a beautiful roof, the other two don't, and they have three meters, we can build a system on that one roof, 
attach it to the single meter, create excess energy, and, the, and once we get that meter down to zero for the month, basically that will act as the host, and the second meter or the third meter will act as a satellite. We can take all the credits and simply apply them to this next bill. It's called remote net meter. It's a very interesting concept, um, and it works very well in certain situations. So a little bit, and again, sorry, this is the weeds. So we're going to get through the weeds, and then we'll, we'll get to the fun stuff. Um, just want to teach you a little bit about your electricity bill. Most of you know this, or many of you may know this, but utility bills in New York State and, and throughout most of the country are, are comprised of usage in kilowatt hours. So turn on a light, run it for an hour, it's going to generate 100 watt light for an hour, you've used 100 watt hours. You run it for two hours, you run, you've used 200 watt hours. Your demand, so that's essentially how much water is trickling out of that, out of that faucet. The demand is how much water is flowing at any one time. So if you turn on only 100 watts and run it, doesn't matter if you run it for one hour, two hours, two weeks, your demand is still 100 watts. But, and your, but your usage will continue to go up. So Con Ed and all the utilities charge for both your usage and your demand. Solar offsets usage, but it doesn't necessarily offset demand because you may use, demand is measured by the utilities as the highest the highest flow of that faucet in any 30 minutes in the month. And that may happen at night, when the sun's not going, when the solar's not doing anything. That may happen when a cloud passes, or, or in any evening when we're not doing much. So we offset usage, but we don't really have that much connection with demand. Demand is behavior-based, um, whereas usage happens over time. This is just give you a little sense. Most of you, in most of the buildings we see, in, and this is Con Ed territory. I know some of you may, may be a little bit outside of this territory, but I'll use Con Ed as an example. Most of you are at the bottom rate, general commercial rates, which are comprised of usage at about 14 and a half cents in demand. And demand is based, the demand rates change a lot. We see two other rates, a, a great deal. Um, so your super departments or smaller parts of the building may be at EL2, commercial small rates. There's no demand rate. So to compensate for that, Con Ed charges a much higher rate per kilowatt hour. So when we attach solar to one of the other meter rates, we actually flow more value for the same energy. So one of the things that we look at when we analyze the building is what are the rate structures, what are you in, and is there any way we can play with these rates to get you more value back? That makes sense. Um, so why do we do solar? The, benefit, the social environmental benefits can't, I'm not going to go into tonight. You guys have heard this for years. They, they make sense to you or they don't. But what we really are looking at are what are the economics? I mean, you're looking at doing this to lower your operating cost. So how does that work? So on an economic basis, you're going to lower cost, but you're also going to be able to control your cost because now you know what energy is going to cost you for an extremely long period of time. Whether you're purchasing it outright, whether you're financing it and have a financing that you're you know, on, on, on level term that you know about, but you're also going to increase the value of the property. Um, silver is one of the few things that you can do that increases the value of the property but does not increase the, uh, your tax assessment. So New York State just extended, uh, did a 15 year extension of the property tax exemption for solar. So renew all renewable energy projects in New York State are exempt for another 15 years. So it's a way to increase the value, lower your operating costs without having any impact uh, on the tax assessment of the building. So what are the economics? If this were a commercial building, which it is, but it isn't, you would get a 30% federal income tax credit with no caps. Spend a million dollars, you get $300,000 in tax credits. You get five-year uh, accelerated depreciation, and you get New York State incentives from NYSERDA, the state energy agency, um, that relate to X, X dollars per watt. So if this were a commercial building, that's what we would get. But you guys are special. And you're special because you're co-ops and condos. So this is, these are the instructions of the 2014 IRS tax form. And what they basically say is, for co-ops and condos, we can build a system that will do common area level, it will do whatever the common charges are, but it will the tax credits will flow through to either your condo owners or your cooperative shareholders in pro rata share to their ownership, as if it were 
their residence and they're putting on a solar system on their on their residence. So it's treated like a residential tax credit, even though it's commercial, it'll be given a commercial and certain incentive, if that makes sense. So I'm sorry to get deep into the weeds here, but this makes a huge difference. So why? You get a federal tax credit of 30%, same, but you get a 25% New York State tax credit. Um, now there's a cap on that, but because we're divvying these systems up amongst all your cooperative shareholders, or all your condo owners, chances are we won't hit that cap. So they'll be getting 55% right there. And they'll get the same New York State upfront incentive from NYSERDA. So when we do all the numbers, it looks something like this. This is a typical example for a 50 kilowatt system. A 50 kilowatt system um, looks like some of the systems some of the pictures I showed you at the beginning of the, of the slideshow. You take up a few thousand square feet on a roof, we generate around $10,000 a year in energy savings, um, and the numbers look something like this. You have your gross cost at the top, and the server will take $45,000 right off that before we even start. So the co-op, or condo, um, would enter into a contract where they'd only be liable for about 144. In the first year, there'll be tax credits, both federal and state, equaling, what, about 90 there. Um, so the net cost of this drops down to 51,000. So 73% of that system is paid for by incentives right in year one. So if, ever, if the co-op, the condo, had a ton of money, and they just wanted to buy it for cash, this is what it would look like. You get an IRR, an after-tax IRR, of over 17% break even in about five years, and you can make about 360000 over the time frame. Um, and by the way, we're using the lowest number for utility rates. We're using that 14.5%, 14 and a half cents, not assuming that you have one of those higher rates. So we look at the level last cost of energy. The systems are going to last for 25 years. Over those 25 years, that 14.5 cents is going to start to creep up. We assume about 3.5% rate increase per year. Um, so on average, you'll pay 24 cents over 25 years for every kilowatt hour that the co-op or the building has to buy. If you did it in, with solar, if you just bought that system outright, you'd pay about 4 cents. It's not a bad deal. But the reality is, most of your buildings, you're not sitting flush with cash, and you can't just go out and spend $100,000, dollars $500,000 on the solar system. You're just, that's not what you do. So what, what practically are we going to do? So one of the things we want to do is finance you. We want to get you financing, and we want to get you long-term, low-cost financing, because you have a long-term asset. Why pay for it on day one? You know, who knows who's going to be living in the building next year, two years from now. Do you want to make sure, do you want to have all the people who are living there today pay for this asset when they're not, maybe not going to be benefiting from it over that time? So we want to finance this with, with a product that also has a similar duration. So one of the things that's come out this year, which is really fairly revolutionary, and it's not available everywhere, we're using this as an example. So where you don't have PACE financing, we'll look at some other financing tools. PACE financing is property assessed clean energy. The concept is that the municipality that the building is in will give you a long-term, low-cost loan. They can they basically work with a, group, a, a, a not for profit called the Energy Improvement Corporation, and that loan is paid back not, you know, by sending a check each month, that loan is paid back as an assessment on your taxes. So just as if you had a special sewer district um, and your building was being assessed as part of the special sewer district, this is, as clean, this is an opt-in clean energy district. And the municipality can go out and borrow very inexpensive money and give you a 20-year loan that's paid back entirely on your property taxes. So the really nice thing about it is this does not affect the building's ability to borrow money if it's not paying your credit, uh, because it's not a loan with a bank. It is a property tax assessment. If for whatever reason the building sells or changes ownership, that loan stays with the property. Um, so it's, it's quite a beautiful thing. This is, this is a product that is rolling out uh, in about half the towns and villages in, within Westchester. Orange County now has it, Ulster County has it. Um, Kevin, you could probably help me as it's, as it's rolling through. We expect it to be available throughout most of New York State within the rest of the year. 
So I've modeled, I've modeled pace on this. And if you're interested, if that makes sense to you, we can talk about the, the specific municipalities. Um, and Kevin, uh, Kevin O'Neill, who works with me here, uh, can also answer those questions for you afterwards. So what would that look like? We take the same system, same nice circuit credits, same contract costs, same federal tax credits, and we say we're going to borrow half that money with a pace loan, we're going to put down half that, and we're going to put down the rest. Well, why are we going to put down anything? Well, the reality is, what you're going to do is you're going to, you want to make sure that the loan is cash positive, and you want, you're going to get so much money back in tax credits right in year one, that you don't want to overly advantage the people who are living in the building at that moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to assess, we're going to do this. We're going to take an imaginary building with 100 owners, each of whom has a magical 1% share. Let's call it a co-op. And they all, they all are 1% shareholders. We're going to assess to each owner $750. Um, and the building will take out this loan. At the end of year one, each of those 1% owners will get back a tax credit equal to $973. So they'll get their money back, and they'll get their and they'll get profit, and they'll be done. One year. In one year, in the first year. As a matter of fact, you don't have to assess them until they've almost gotten money back. So you could sort of assess them a little late, take the money back, you know, have them get their, depending on how they fall in the tax credit year, depending on, you know, where April 15 falls, and you're, you're done. The building, gets the value. The building now has a, has a long-term, low-cost loan, and it's making money every year on its energy savings, the difference between loan and the energy savings. So the building's making 38% in year one on its, you know, it's just, it's lowering its electrical by 38% in year one, and as the value of, uh, as kind of keeps increasing the rates, that savings goes up. So the building will save in this, in this scenario, $256,000, quarter of a million dollars of life of the system, the building will put up nothing, taking out a long-term low-cost loan, you assess your, your people, they get their money back and profit immediately. There's no downside. This is what the cash flow looks like. You'll see the $75,000 um, that you assessed, your loan costs, the incentives, from NYSER are on the year zero line. They actually come back uh, before the system is finished. Um, second line of the incentives are the, the both New York State and federal tax credits that come back, and the rest of it is savings. You have loan costs, you have some uh, maintenance and operation costs, and then you have your electric savings. So it's pretty, I know this is a small title, so I apologize, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, based on Putting up seventy-five thousand dollars, assuming that you stay in the building or, or receiving the value, assuming that that energy savings is being passed through the cooperators or the con uh, or the condo owners as lower operating costs, those are what your rates of return look like. Your cash flow positive in year one, essentially the, the minute you get your tax credits back, you're you're ahead. You're making forty-three and a half percent on your money. You're saving the building's saving a quarter of a million dollars, or you're all saving it. Uh, in, their, in their share, and you're now paying seven cents for energy instead of 24 cents. That's why we do solar. Um, so what, do you, what else do you need to know about this? Where you don't have pace financing, we're going to look for another financing source so we can move that over time, spread that value out so we're not hitting everyone at once. Um, the biggest thing that's going to change, NYSERDA is the NYSERDA incentive, and if you looked at NYSERDA paid 20-something percent of the value of this, and it comes right off the top. NYSERDA's stated goal is to reduce the incentive so that eventually solar is on parity with utility costs. Uh, they basically just want to get out of the incentive business, and they want to do that because more and more people are installing solar. So as more and more solar gets installed, the incentive drops. And it's a design declining incentive. So we're at, this is uh, a couple of weeks old, this slide. We're at the second block. Each time we go, we drop about 10% in the value of this incentive. Um, what we know is it will decline. So as time goes on, what we're seeing right now is we've already hit the low point of solar pricing. It's starting to edge back up. We've, maybe some of you have read about the tariff where we're having in China. It's a lot of fun. Um, but solar has hit its low point price-wise. And we're into the last year and a half of the 30% federal tax credit. 
So the 30% federal tax credit sunsets um, last day of 2016, assuming it doesn't get extended. So we have another year or two to build um, and to get into contracting. We assume there'll be safe harbor provisions. That mean as long as we've done something to get in, in the project moving by the end of 2016, that'll be valid um, for 2006, you know, in 2017. But nevertheless, there is, um, Time is of the essence of this. We, we're looking at the last really two good years um, from a federal perspective, from a tax perspective, and from NYSERDA. We're seeing this, you know, this uh, incentive nibble away. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, Kevin O'Neill does our commercial development um, for Sunrise. So if you have questions uh, specific to projects, I'd be happy to help you. But Kevin's really the one who's going to be uh, fielding most of those questions. Um, again, thank you very much for having me. And uh, <laughs> moving right along, proper pet policies for your building a complex. We will start with Kathleen Jensen Graham, a member of the Co-op Condo Council and a member of the Board of Directors of the Co-op Condo Council. Kathleen is no stranger to our association. She served as a valued member of the negotiating committee of the Building and Realty Institute in its negotiations last year with Local 32 BJ Service Employees International Union for a new labor contract between the BRI and Local 32 BJ. She is also a member of the Special Events Committee of the Building and Realty Institute. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Hilltop Terrace, a New Rochelle-based co-op, she serves as the organization's treasurer. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Kathleen Jensen Graham. Good evening, everybody. I've come to tell you our story with pet policy in our co-op. I know this is something that's going on throughout Westchester County, throughout New York City, and problematic for all of us. I will give you the background on our case we had a shareholder who had two dogs at a time that we instituted a one dog under 30 pound pet policy or two cats. She was grandfathered in. She had a dog pass away and we then discovered she had a second dog that she said that she was taken care of for her mother, who we subsequently found out lived in a no pet building. So that point was moved. Um, we didn't know about the two cats that had come on board that eventually did. Uh, we had a gas leak on the property in early 2012 when my fellow board member, Dory Engley, had occasion with Con Edison to go into her co-op, her unit, which is a very small studio, and found that she was housing a rather large pit bull. Had not been in common sight to any of us. At that time, we had issued through our attorney, a notice to cure, because the dog was outside the standard pet policy. Subsequently found out that a member of our board who was friendly with the shareholder, had had knowledge of this dog. We were told at that time by her that the dog was a rescue dog and was just in temporary residence. Nonetheless, we found out later that a board member knew about this dog and we came under the 90-day pet rule. So the notice to cure went nowhere. Then we started to get letters from shareholders about the aggressiveness of the dog. And I can attest to that. I had to walk past her unit to go to the laundry facilities. The dog lunged at the door. I changed my lifestyle. If I was coming home late, I would have my husband put his car into the garage so that I could park outside because the noise was terrible to surrounding shareholders. Um, 
after we got a number of letters complaining about the aggressiveness and, and attacks of the dog upon them, we knew it was our obligation to pursue this because if somebody was eventually hurt, it would be our responsibility. So we did, again, pursue through our attorney a notice to cure, and that's when we started our legal battle. I will tell you financially now, we are at $36,000 with the meter running. We have lost our summary proceeding in that the city judge felt that we did not actually prove the aggressiveness of the dog. We have overcome one HUD complaint about discrimination and we are now in our second HUD complaint with the shareholder's attorney demanding $25,000 for settlement of her legal expenses in this case. One case had nothing to do with any, the other. We, can, we instituted summary proceeding due to the aggressiveness of the dog. They are now claiming discrimination in that the shareholder is now claiming that she is emotionally dependent upon this dog. Mind you, she lives in a studio apartment with now three dogs, two cats, and actually, as of today, three cats. Uh, but it, it is what's going on. I have looked at the threads on the internet about people who live in no pet co-ops and want dogs. And the answers when people go out in threads and say, how can I get around co-op rules, refer them to this attorney that our shareholder used. Um, Jeff is actually going to send you via email a list of articles that I have put together from the internet that I of course could not reprint because they are copyrighted and I don't need any more legal problems. <laughs> but he'll send you a list of articles about pet policies. The bottom line is that I think it leaves us in co-ops as paper lions. There is a way around our pet policies. It's very expensive to fight it. I mean, our meter is still ticking. We are not done with the second HUD complaint. It's impacting our directors and officers' liability insurance. And as soon as somebody claims that these dogs are service dogs, you're out in the cold. There's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. Um, I have read that the law says that they have to prove that they have this medical complaint or emotional complaint. And Jory, who is going to speak next, will tell you that we were unable to ascertain that. We were unable to get a ruling from her attorney. Of course, we were not going on the discrimination case, we were going on the aggressive dog case. But it's a real problem, and it leaves us, I think, as co-op boards, as paper lions. How do you force, enforce any of your house rules? And how do I tell the next shareholder who has their apartment up for sale and has a buyer who has a 32 pound dog that I'm rejecting that sale when I have someone who has six pets in a tiny little place with one of them way over 30 pounds. It becomes a real, real problem. Dory, if you want to talk to them, you were present at the proceedings, so. I have to say. The only thing I would like to add is, I think, I know Kathy doesn't agree with me on this, that we would have won the case if when we first went to trial, 
that they heard the case. But the tactic of the other attorney, it's postponed, 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 and after a year and a half, almost two years, a lot of our witnesses either have moved or are afraid to get involved now or are or working. So we ended up with three viable witnesses, but they weren't the ones that really wrote the good letters. We had one mom who has a small child, and I think we wouldn't want the case if she could go, but she ended up getting a job. Her daughter was a little older, started school, and she wasn't going to take off just to come and testify and maybe not get to testify if they postponed again. Um, basically, I, I think having a pet policy or a pet rule in your house rules is a waste of time. I mean, and, I, and I'm a pet person, but I know the apartment next to this woman now is up for sale, and they get afraid when they see a pit bull. So, I mean, I don't know how else to tell you to save your money. We had no choice but to go to court. Once you get complaints in writing, as a board, you have to act upon them, but if you just get verbal complaints, just tell them, you know, they want to report them. Keep your shareholders educated. If someone would have told us immediately, this person is no longer on the board. I mean, obviously, he kept it a secret. But if one of the neighbors would have told us, you know, there's a large dog in there, we could have gotten out within the 90 day rules. But I think it was over five months. And I only found out accidentally. I went in with Con Edison into everyone's apartments because of our gas leak. And there it was in a big cage trying to kill the Con Ed guys. <laughs> <laughs> So all I can say is, you know, be prudent, educate your shareholders, and if they see something, they should tell you. But are you saying that the no, dog was never taken out during the day or at night? No, it was never taken out during the day. She never walked them on the grounds. She would pull her car up to her door and get all the dogs right in the front seat of the car. And yet they never barked? There was no noise in the apartment? Not until I went in with Kaya. How did she keep them? She kept them created. She kept them in a cage. And muzzled. Which and, and, and muzzled, which is, wasn't much bigger than her. She has a studio apartment. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Right, so I can see the ones, I can see the ones that are in the uh, winning that case, but she has not Yeah, that's what I Well, we also, we also tried to find out, because during the proceedings, and I had said to my attorney, I said, well, find out, you know, what's your disability? Because we had won the first part of the discrimination case, they, I had to go up and give a deposition. And they're like, oh, do you have anything against her? I'm like, no, I, I think she's a nice woman. I didn't even know she had a dog. You know, I, was, I have no problems with her. So she lost the first part. So then she took us to, when we went to court, we took her to court. I said to her attorney, well, find out what her disability is. I mean, maybe it is a mental disability. Maybe you need medication, but how many pets do you need for emotional support? Five, six, seven? And I said, is it emotional? Is it physical? Because it's a big dog. Maybe she won't be able to, you know, she's a skinny woman. This dog can drag her down the driveway if you have to. We were not allowed to find out what the disabilities were. We were only told physical and mental. That was it. Okay, in our And if the dog bites someone? Okay, we've never had a situation in our building where a dog has bitten anyone. Because <laughs> we're very, you know, we, we, we have a committee, a pet committee um, that is... And you, you know, say you don't allow reptiles, but if someone says they need it for emotional support? We've had people, people that have asked, we have people that have moved into the building, um, that are renters, we don't allow renters to have any pets, not even a fish, okay? We've had renters moving into the building they can get them. and saying that they need therapy animals, and we tell them, well, the, the guidelines are that you have to present it up. It has to be a therapy certified animal. It can't just be a pet. It has to be a therapy certified animal. They have to have certain like, legal uh, requirements that they have to submit to, to show that they can have that 